the November 29th um, UN resolution. One of the things you must pay attention to is how the United States voted. And that happened essentially because of one man and one man alone, and that's the President of the United States, Harry S. Truman. Um, the opposition of the State Department was total. George Marshall was to march into Harry Truman's office uh, later on in the early um, period of 1948 and say to Truman directly that if you recognize the state of Israel, uh, I will not vote for you in the next election. For a hero as a general of, uh, who had taken us through World War II, who had served as the Secretary of State, who turned out to be extraordinarily visionary in the Marshall Plan, to say that directly to the President of the United States was outstanding. I did, uh, many years ago, an oral history with uh, a man by the name of Herbert Fierst. To understand Herbert Fierst, you have to understand that Herbert Fierst was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, Yale and Harvard graduate who looked like the prototypical wasp, sounded like the prototypical wasp, dressed like the prototypical wasp, had the manners of the prototypical wasp, but had the soul of a Zionist. And he was a young State Department official when he was asked to take a series of documents. And he was told under no circumstances are these documents to uh, wind up in the hands of the Zionists. The State Department at that point was deeply fearful of the Zionist influence and deeply fearful also of the people who had been a residue of the, um, of the people who were dissatisfied with the way in which the State Department had behaved in World War II against a deep and a profound WASP establishment that believed that they knew best what was in American interest and sought to align American interest with the uh, Arab world. This was common both to Democrats and, Republic, and Republicans at that point. It was uh, a nonpartisan, uh, a bipartisan agreement as to what was in America's interest. Uh, Fierst took those documents, but before he took those documents, he shared the content of those documents with two men in the Truman White House, David Niles and uh, Clark, um, uh, Clark Clifford, Clark Clifford, and Clifford uh, was again one of these very handsome, very stark, um, uh, deeply WASP elites who had been an advisor to Harry Truman and who was very strongly pro-State uh, of Israel. I'm not sure that it was equally pro-Jewish, but he was pro-State of Israel at that point shared those documents with them, and a decision was made that there would be a direct line between the President of the United States and the Ambassador to the United Nations on the night of November 29th when this vote was to be taken, and that the last word that was to be heard by the United Nations Ambassador uh, of the United States were the instructions not from the Secretary of State but directly from the President of the United States. There were people manning the line, and I'm being gender specific because they were men at that point, manning the line to make sure that the last voice to be heard was the voice of Harry S. Truman. And so it was, and so were the instructions on that day. And Truman overrode the State Department and Truman had several people in the White House who made sure that the one word that was heard was the President of the United States instructs you to say the word yes. Now just a couple of words about Harry Truman to set the scene. Harry Truman, um, first of all, was deeply impacted by the Holocaust itself. And he was deeply impacted by the question of the refugees. There's a very famous uh, story that on July 4th, 1946, there was a, a pogrom in Kielce, Poland. 
And uh, we saw last night the 1946 uh, film, uh, 45 film. In 46, there was this uh, pogrom. In Kelsa, 42 Jews were killed. And uh, then there was uh, the clear indication that Jewish life in Poland was dangerous. And there would be a tremendous wave of immigration headed by Bricha over the line and into American and British held territory. Um, General McNarty sent a uh, Rochester rabbi who was his chief advisor on Jewish affairs to meet directly with the President of the United States. He met with the President of the United States. And Truman instructed him, his name was Rabbi Rabinowitz, Truman instructed him as follows. I know, Rabbi, you haven't seen your wife in a year and a quarter. You are to go directly from here back to your Air Force base, to your Army Air Force base. You are to take a plane here. You are not to make any calls, not to speak to anyone, not to say anything publicly. You are to go directly to the General McNarty and tell him that the President of the United States says, keep the borders open. I will not penalize these people who are seeking freedom. Truman himself felt, and this is the impact of the Bible, Truman himself felt that he was Cyrus and felt that he would go down in Jewish history. And for him, Jewish history was a long history. By the way, with all the friendship for Eddie Jacobson, Eddie Jacobson could not come into Harry Truman's uh, home because Truman's mother-in-law and his wife were profoundly anti-Semitic and would not have a Jew inside their home. But when Harry Truman died, on his night table was a copy of Yigal Yadin's Masada. And that is he continued to his dying day a great interest in Jewish history and believed, and rightfully so, and we should remember him as so, believed that he was King Cyrus to the Jews. Cyrus is the king who allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem, to return to Israel at that point, after a period of exile. One comment on Israel, which I want us to keep in mind. Um, you know, there's a, a terrible slogan which is emotionally, deeply, and profoundly true, but historically nonsense, which is, and I hate to say this because you're going to throw uh, eggs at me, whenever they say that Jerusalem is the um, uh, eternal, undivided capital of the Jewish people, that's not a historical reality. That's a that may be a metaphysical reality. It may be a spiritual reality, not a historical reality. We are on the edge of 70 years of an independent Jewish state. To give you an idea of that significance, that is longer than the historic period of David and Solomon, which is the first time that Jerusalem became the capital of Israel. It's longer than the Soviet Union. It's longer than communism and the Soviet Union. It's longer than David and Solomon. And remember, after Solomon may have been the wisest of men, but he did not handle the transition and succession all that well. And immediately afterwards, the kingdom was divided. It is longer than the independence of the Maccabean rule longer than the independence of the Maccabean rule, longer than Hanukkah had a real achievement, is the achievement of the State of Israel. The responsibility of this generation and its successors is to make sure that that achievement lasts more than 120 years, and that that achievement becomes a sustained achievement, which in its most profound sense is not an end to exile, but it's a transformation of Jewish destiny. Mm -hmm.